the series is the book of Romans. It is the first of Paul's uh, epistle here, not that it was written first, but uh, in the arrangement, it is the first book. And it is also a very important book for us to understand. Until Easter, we are going to study this book, but in between, we will have many standby sermons. So the series is called the Book of Romans, and uh, today's sermon is God's acquittal of sinners. It is based on Romans chapter 1, verses 3 to chapter 3, verse 26. It's a very long passage. Not that I'm going to read the entire passage, but uh, this is the passage. We will go back in the coming weeks, flush them out. Uh, there are a lot of uh, minor subjects that we need to study, but there is only one theme in this large chunk of uh, teaching from Paul. That is Romans 1, verse 3 to chapter 3, verse 26. Before we start this long journey of book of Romans, uh, let's just do a little bit of background study. The church in Rome comprised of both Jews and non-Jewish Christian followers. Non-Christians seem to be more in number than the Jewish Christians. It looks like that the church in Rome was not founded by any individual, but Christians from other parts of Roman Empire moved to Rome at some point for business and for studies, for politics, uh, so on and so forth. A good number of believers in church at Rome knew Paul. Most likely, they came from churches that Paul established in the east, uh, east of Rome, that is Macedonia and Asia, Bithynia, Galatia, probably other churches which we don't know. Uh, as we know, uh, people always move to the cities, particularly to the capital city, most likely uh, from the churches that Paul established, a lot of them moved to Rome. Initially, Jewish Christians gave leadership. And uh, they gave leadership when the church was getting formed. But they had to leave Rome somewhere around AD 48 because of an edict by Claudius, the emperor. You can read about it in Acts chapter 18. When Jewish Christians left Rome for the next six years between this edict by Claudius and his death in 54, the church in Rome was headed by non-Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians. After the death of Claudius, Jewish Christians began to move to Rome and attending their old churches or the small groups. By then, the church in Rome got used to Gentile Christian leadership their teaching. Uh, probably the church had by then grown in number. Jewish Christian leaders probably tried to usurp their old leadership because they were the main people when they left Rome. And after six years when they came back to Rome, everything was different. The church was big and there were many new leaders and they led according to their leadership, that is Gentile leadership, they probably felt out of place, but they tried to usurp uh, to their old positions with their theological preferences that are Jewish in nature. But non-Christian leaders pushed back. This caused considerable conflict between Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians. And they are not only racial, but also theological. Jewish Christians had a tendency called Judaizing tendency. They emphasized uh, circumcision, so observance of Sabbath, and uh, you know, importance to the teachings of Moses. But the non-Christians uh, or non-Jewish Christians followed a law-free teaching. 
And if you look at these three chapters, Romans 1, 2, and 3, the most dominant theme is equality of Jews and Gentiles before God. In other words, God is impartial. He is not favorable to the Jews uh, and then less favorable to the Gentiles. That is not the theme. It's God is impartial. And if you look at the entire book, there are two themes we are going to really work on. And uh, it is not going to be like a seminary class, but it will be more like a uh, pastoral teaching. One is called justification. We will talk about it a little bit later. The other one is people of God. How uh, a group of people from Jewish and non-Jewish background came to form a faith community and how they behave in this world. And uh, that is going to be a major chunk of our teaching. So let's now come to the passage. Both religious and non-religious people stand condemned before God. That is one of the main themes of these three chapters. Both religious and non-religious people stand condemned before God. Let me read a few verses here. Uh, chapter 3, verse 9. We have already charged that Jews and Greeks alike are under sin. Saying, hey, Jews, you are from Jewish background. You have had Moses, the prophet, and the writings, and you had the temple. Doesn't mean God is going to show you any favor. If you are a sinner, you are a sinner. And looked at the Gentiles, hey, you were from a non-Jewish background. You have had your own religious emphasis. But now you stand before God and you are not different. If you're a sinner, you are a sinner. So both religious and non-religious people stand condemned before God. Chapter 2, verse 11. There is no partiality with God. All who have sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Then in chapter 3, verse 23, most of us know all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Paul is building his argument in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Chapter 1, he says those people who have ignored God's revelation that he revealed through nature, through their conscience, but deliberately went after things uh, they created and worshipped. In those days, the imperial worship, that is king worship, was so prevalent, and they were worshipping Augustus Caesar along with pantheon of gods. They said, God has judged you. Chapter 1, and he has given you over to your fleshly desires, perversions, like homosexuality, and people exchanging uh, unnatural things for the natural ones. And he's saying it is a condemnation from God because you deliberately ignored the living God and you went after uh, the things that you created. Then he looks at the Jews, he says, you guys, you think you are a leader, but you are a blind leader. Things that you know that you should not do, you did it. So you are not different in any way. Some people did not have the law instruction and they went astray, but you had the instruction, you also went astray. In other words, there is no difference. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. As we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, you were enemies, separated from God. You know, if someone is a sinner, whether they are Jews or non-Jews, whether they are religious and non-religious, they are God's enemies, and they are separated from God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, we read, we were by nature deserving God's wrath. God's anger, uh, not only punishment physically in this world, but punishment eternally. 
Romans 6, 23, we read, the wages of sin is death. Both non-religious and religious people stand condemned before God, according to this passage. There is a very popular uh, scholar and pastor. He passed away a few years ago by name John Stott. This is what he says. All human beings of every race and rank, of every creed and culture, Jews and Gentiles, the immoral and moralizing, the religious and irreligious, are without any exception, sinful, guilty, inexcusable, and speechless before God. That was the terrible human predicament described in Romans 1, he says, 18 to 320. That is the premise on which we are going to build our discussion today. That is, a religious and non-religious people, both are sinners and they stand condemned before God. No one would be able to beat their chest and say, hey, we are standing before you because we gave you a lot of money, we gave you a lot of time, and we were religious, we were born in a Christian home, therefore we can have an access to you without your help that is your son, our Lord Jesus. So anyone who is an enemy of God, who stands condemned before God, and who uh, deserves death, they need to be punished. God, as a righteous judge, needs to really condemn them, go to hell. Oh, I'm going to punish. But something different happens in this passage. In, instead of convicting them, God acquits them. Convicting is punishing. Acquitting is releasing. We read that in verse 24. 324 is a very powerful passage. Let me read it for uh, our context from verse 21. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between a Jew and a Gentile. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And all are justified freely by his grace to, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Jesus, the righteous judge, is standing. The law and the conscience, the public prosecutor is convicting, you know, bringing all the charges Subhash is a sinner, he needs to be punished, he needs to be eternally condemned, and there is no way he is going to escape, not only in this life, many, many lives, because the punishment is so much, the, the sin is so much, uh, probably 1,000 counts or 10,000 counts. It cannot be paid back in one life. It can be only paid back in the eternal hell. And the righteous judge is standing like this. And he looks at Subhash, and instead of convicting him, he acquits them. In other words, he says, you are free. By the faithfulness of Jesus, God grants sinners a righteous status that is required to stand before him. Without a shadow of doubt, conscience and the law point finger at Subhash and say, you are a sinner. You deserve punishment and you need to go to hell. And the judge is completely convinced. And he looks at me and he says, you are free. And he says, you are righteous. And I'm actually the, just the opposite. I'm just shocked. How can I be righteous? That is why Paul says, by the faithfulness of Jesus. God provided in Jesus a punishment, a substitution. That God did not just say, you are free because he is God. He could have done it, but he is just. So he had to be justified in his pronouncement of justice. He released Subhash because someone else paid for it. Jesus paid for Subhash's past sin, present sin, and future sin. And he says, you have a righteous stand. 
a status. No one would be able to stand before God because all are sinners and they cannot even look up to God even one second because God is holy and no one will be able to reach God because we are unholy. But suddenly God gives a status, a righteous status. Not that I am inherently righteous, not that I am always thinking good, always doing good, but someone else paid for my sins of the past, the present, and the future, and he grants a righteous status. All I can do is I just look around. Did you just tell me? Is it me that you acquit? Is this me that you released me from all the punishment and on the top of that you gave me an access? Is it me? Because I myself do not know I deserve it. I know I deserve just the opposite. I say, yes, it is you. It is you because I have already taken care of it because of your son, because of my son, Jesus. It is an amazing thing. This is called the gospel. The gospel is God's provision in Jesus through which the sinner who deserved to be in eternal hell is released to have an eternal relationship with the Father. Not through any good work, not through any birth, not through any church or a religious institution, but through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, which God provided. When a person believes, when they believe in Jesus, God declares sinners righteous. It's a declaration. He looks at Caleb here, and he needs to be condemned a sinner, but he calls righteous but they deserve just the opposite. This declaration is called, technical term, justification. It is a legal act of God by which he declares a sinner righteous based on his provision that he gave or he uh, he provided in Jesus. So if you have believed in Jesus' coming to this world, and if you have believed Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in your heart, and you responded, in other words, God, you give me what you are offering through your son, our Lord Jesus. God declares you righteous. It is a status. It is a right standing before God. Not through the law, not through moralism, not through any type of good work. Not that, you know, I speak uh, always truth and not that I do all the meritorious things that deserves uh, God's acceptance. No, God gives that righteous stand. He never takes it away from us. And that is why we say we come into the presence of God through Jesus, and we have that access 24-7. It is not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. The problem with the church was some people were throwing weight. They said, we are more religious, and we deserve a little bit special uh, treatment. But other people thought, we cannot even enter into the church. We cannot even raise our voice because our life is so bad. Whether you are religious or not religious, when you stand before God, you are a sinner, but if you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, then God declares you righteous, and God is impartial. He is not a respecter of people. Oh, you are from this race, you are from this race. Not at all. He declares, he pronounces a person righteous. And I'm so thankful to the Lord this morning to know that I'm a righteous person. And a lot of people think, are you righteous? But I don't think you are righteous because you have so many things in your back. No, if God has pronounced it, he has pronounced it. It is a scandal in those days. Zacchaeus, a tax collector, Paul, a persecutor, 
Not at all. It is not possible. Augustine, a person who was indulging so much in his flesh, can he be accepted? Yes, he can. God is not a respecter of anyone. It is not that you are a good man God accepts. He accepts. He knows who he needs to accept and he accepts. And when he accepts, he pronounces they are completely guiltless. In other words, they say, you're not going to hell, you're going to heaven. And not only in the future, but you have a, an access to me 24-7 through Jesus. God grants his grace to those who stand condemned before him. It is a gracious act of God. God doesn't need to be gracious. He is not obligated to be gracious. Grace is received, never earned. You know, we cannot stand before God and say, God, you know, I need to really uh, earn the grace. As we know the story of the prodigal son. The, the prodigal son had nothing to claim before the father. He was utterly sinful. But he came back and he received his father's acceptance. Whereas the older son, he claimed his stand before the father. I did this, I did this, I did this. That is why Jesus says, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. And gospel is not only for us to be saved, but it, is, it continues. Our acceptance before God is not based on what we do every day and what we speak every day and how we conduct our life every day, our acceptance before God is granted to us through Jesus. That is the faithfulness of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. It is a hope for those people who have sinned, who have dishonored God, who have so much of guilt and a lot of time people think that I cannot get back to God. No, you start with grace, continue with grace, end with grace. That's what we are going to study next week, following week, and the weeks after. Grace is received and is never earned. It comes through faith, not through meritorious activities. God accomplished Sinners acquittal by appointing Jesus to die on their behalf. Let me read verse 25 here. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. And we have, in some translations, it is sacrifice of propitiation. Some translation will say a mercy seat. Because this particular Greek word doesn't have an equivalent English word. So some people say, God appeased himself by the death burial of our Lord Jesus. Because God, all the time, is so upset when there is a sin. And he can be angry. So when people use the word propitiation, they say God's appeasement of the death burial uh, of our Lord Jesus. Some people say God presented Jesus as the mercy seat. This, in other words, you know, the, the mercy seat was introduced by uh, Martin Luther. He said the coming of God to human being purely through his mercy and Jesus is that mercy seat. And I believe that even today, how do we access God and how does he become available to us 24-7, not waiting for one full year? It is through Jesus. Jesus continues to be mercy seat. You have done really bad now. The five minutes later, can you go to the mercy seat? Yes, of course you can go back. And you have uh, done something that really you shouldn't have done it and afterwards, do you need to really carry your guilt and live? No, you can still go to the mercy seat because Jesus is the mercy seat. God is not looking at you, but he is looking at his son. And our acceptance is not based on who we are. Our acceptance is based on who his son is. 
His son is our intercessor, 24-7. What an amazing gospel. A lot of people think it is a scandal. It is a scandal. <laughs> you know, God did something very scandalous. He looks at a sinner and he says, you're a quitter. Not only acquitting him, he says, I'm justifying you as a righteous person. And not only that, you know, for a good man, a good man can be sacrificed. Now, for a sinner, a holy, a person who had no sin is sacrificed. It is scandalous. That shows God is gracious. What is he doing now? He is going after the sinners. What is he doing? He is going after the so-called believers who have been carrying heavy uh, guilt in them. But they don't need to. They can actually get back to God because God has provided us a mercy seat in Jesus. And although we have done so many things, we can get back to God and ask forgiveness from Him because He deals with us according to what His Son has done on the cross. It is not because of what you did today, yesterday, day before yesterday. That is why I call it it's a scandalous thing. God presented Jesus Christ a sacrifice of atonement. If you read Leviticus chapter 16, where you read about one animal sacrificed for the sin of the many. And you read John chapter 18 and 19, Jesus three times was declared sinless. But still, Jesus was offered as a sacrifice. And when Jesus died, uttered the final word, the curtain that separated the holy place and holy of holies just torn open. Until then, God had a separation from people. But this Emmanuel who hung on the cross, when he uttered the final word and died, God was amazingly satisfied. And he said, there is no more separation. And through Jesus, the mercy seat, the seat of propitiation, and he becomes available to you and me all the time. Whether you are a Jew or a non-Jew, whether you are a religious person, non-religious person, doesn't matter. I am so amazed with this God. That is why this God is so gracious. That is why this God is compassionate merciful God. He comes after us. God justifies guilty sinners by God's grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone. And you need to actually keep singing this. It's God's grace alone, in Christ alone, and faith alone. If we are sitting here today and if we believe God is building the church around the world, how is he doing? He is doing it through his grace, through his son, and through the faith. And Christian unity is based on these three important components. God's grace, and Christ alone, and faith alone. That actually unites us. Why are we sitting here today? Because we were sinners, we needed to be condemned, but God graciously uh, declared us righteous because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And we look at us, oh, why are you sitting here? God, Christ, faith. It's amazing. So you look at all three chapters, all three chapters are climaxed in chapter 3, verse 21 to 25. In that, Paul says, you know, a lot of people, the people in the Old Testament and uh, uh, the prophets and uh, saints were looking for a righteousness that was going to be revealed outside of the law. That people would be able to stand before God with a righteous status without the legalistic and moralistic life. And now God offers through the faithfulness of Jesus, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And how did he do? He did it by offering Jesus as a, a sacrifice of propitiation. And when you look at this one, God is both just 
and righteous. He did his justice. Instead of you hanging on the cross, his son hung on the cross. In that way, he's just. And he's also righteous. What is righteous? He's a righteous person. And he continues to accept us. When you read this passage, you, your blood boils. You are filled with emotion. And you just look around. God, what should I do for you? What should I do for you? God has done so much for you. And he has turned your life around. What shall you do? Paul actually talks about what you can do in chapter 12, verse 1. And we will be actually looking at chapter 12, verse 1 every week. It is a reasonable response. See, God sent his son, changed your destiny. You were a sinner, but you are now a righteous person. And you have an access 24-7 to God. And you are no more a sinner. You are able to stand before God. And you have a mercy seat that gives you access 24-7. So God, you have done everything that I need. What shall I do? What shall I do? Can I give you money? Can I give you my hair? Can I just give you something else? My car? You can give all of them. But that will not reciprocate. So Paul actually talks about all this amazing picture of the gospel. And finally he comes to chapter 12. And he says... I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your true and proper worship. In other words, he's saying this is the reasonable response. The bare minimum response that you can do is renounce a claim on yourself. Would you be able to do it? Renouncing claim on yourself. If you evaluate what you discuss every day, I will be there maybe 10,000 times. I want to do this. 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 I, this is my desire. But Paul is saying, now you look at God, you look at Jesus, you look at the Holy Spirit of God. We are going to talk about it next week. And you look at all these things. See this triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are working for your benefit. And they not only saved you, but they continue to save you, continue to just work in your life. What can you do? The reasonable thing that you can do is give your life voluntarily for the purpose of bringing pleasure to God. Living holy and acceptable. In other words... You renounce claim over yourself. Don't be Lord of your life. Let him be the Lord of your life. Your life henceforth is not going to be, oh, I'm going to speak well and I'm not going to sin. I'm not. All those things are great. But anything that you say, I want to do it, maybe next five minutes, that is what you are going to do it. Because the life God has called, He has called, and He has to take you forward. It is not your effort that you are going to take it forward. But when God is just taking you in this journey, one thing you can do is, God, it is not me, but it is you. How is it going to uh, look? When you have renounced a claim over your life. You are looking every opportunity to make God big. God, you have done so much which I could not have done, my father could not have done, my pastor could not have done, but you have done it. How do I respond? I want to please you. It is not a legalism. That is a reasonable response, reasonable human response. How can I do it, Father? Will it... If I really love my brother Tia, will he be pleased? Yes. If I really take care of a person who is so vulnerable, so weak, will he be pleased? Yes. If I go and just intercede for a person once a week, will he be pleased? Yes. 
If a missionary is there in Nepal, could I just send some money? Yes. In our church, there are some people who I don't know if I just go and give them a hug or a good shake and will you be pleased? Yes. Oh, that is not my comfort zone. Giving is not my comfort zone. Interceding for others is not my comfort zone. Hugging is not my comfort zone. Shaking hands. Oh, it is not your comfort zone. That means you still have a claim over your life. But now that you, Paul is teaching, you know, when God has done so much for you, what is your reasonable response? The reasonable response is renouncing claim. That means you come out of your comfort zone. Oh, I will come to church only at 11 o'clock. Fine. That is your comfort zone. But how about God, if I come a little early, I will be able to just welcome other people. I can be, uh, and, uh, I can do a little bit of ushering. God, my comfort zone, I don't have any uh, thing from Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday. You know, will you, God, will you be pleased if I set aside some time and join a small group where I can, I have the opportunity to love others? It's great. You know, we step out of our comfort zone and we look for an opportunity to please the Father and continue to please the Father because that is our reasonable response. Let's just look for an opportunity this week. Will it be all right if I forgave my wife? Or will the Father be happy if I just go and give a nice hug to my husband? Or if I take my uh, spouse to a restaurant, will Father be uh, happy? Yes, go ahead and do it. Will, I, will God be happy if I go and restore a person in my workplace? That person has done so much damage to me, but still I want to just go and forgive that person. I want to say, hey, I, it is not because that is my comfort zone. My natural tendency is to take revenge. Not once, not twice, many times, as many times as possible. But a reasonable response to what God has done in our life is to please Him by renouncing our claim on our lives. You know, in their life, our church will never be the same. Our workplace will never be the same. Our family will never be the same. And we are going to continue this theme in the coming days. How can we extend a reasonable response to this amazing, gracious, compassionate, merciful God. I pray that the gospel, which is very simple, will continue to really transform our lives in this new year. Let's pray. Father, we are speechless. Why would you want to do this? Why would you want to justify a sinner, uh, acquit a person who needs to be condemned. I could not forgive myself, but why would you let your son die for me? I didn't have a background. I condemn myself, but you don't condemn. You are so gracious. I don't deserve it, but you continue to be gracious. Even after you pronounced me as just and righteous, I have done a lot of things that hurt you. I have hurt others and uh, I used others. I became self-reliant and I uh, ignored your continuous work in my life. But still you're so gracious. I'm speechless this morning along with my brothers and sisters. Would you help us today to understand this gospel message? And also would you equip us to respond to you although you don't expect the response? 
but would you, Father, quicken our conscience and our desires to renounce the claim over our lives? And uh, would you please help us to give our life completely to you as a sacrifice, living, holy, and acceptable? Just as Paul says in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. I don't live any longer. But the life that I live now, I live because of Christ. Father, we pray that you bring us to that state where our life will be completely lost in you. We thank you for this amazing passage that we read and we studied. May it continue to work in our hearts. In Jesus' name.